We would like to start Ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce the last speaker of this conference, let me take the opportunity to thank uh, the director of the Center of Rationality, Eyal Winter, for the inspiring and terrific conference celebrating the Center's 20th uh, anniversary. <clears throat> let me also thank the wonderful Center staff Hannah, Romina, Elinor, Talia, Mike, Daniel, uh, for their uh, uh, great uh, work uh, today as ever. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Israel Oman, uh, the 2005 Nobel Laureate in Economics, is identified more than everybody else with game theory and with our center. Israel Oman created the landscape of game theory as we see today. His deep mathematical studies describe its frontiers. His studies of foundational and conceptual issues are not only instrumental in answering the question, what is game theory, but also touch on foundational question in philosophy, economics, statistics, and the law. Oman was always fascinating in how game theory is applied in real life, modern and ancient. In the center inauguration conference 20 years ago, Israel delivered a fascinating talk entitled, Game Theory in Jerusalem, BC. Today he will ask, who is the player? Israel, please. Uh, okay, good. Thank you. So this talk uh, um, is uh, it's it's uh, philosophy day over here. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, like the like the previous uh, lecture. We're going to talk about um, perception and uh, conceptualization. Uh, maybe a little more conceptualization than uh, perception. But I, from what I understood from the previous talk, uh, there is. Uh, there is uh, a close connection between perception and conceptualization. It's really two sides of the same coin. Okay, so um, let me take out my notes. Uh, in applications of game theory, um, a player when we talk you know we have we have games and in in uh, in in the theory itself the games uh, have players one two three up to n let the player set be one up to n yes and then we define uh, coalitions of players and, and strategies that the players have uh, and um, things of that kind. But, uh, but uh, in applications, we have to identify who the player is. So in applications of game theory, a player is a, could be, first of all, a person. Yeah, okay, that's the simplest kind of application, but that's not the, uh, uh, not the usual application, in fact. We have, it could be a household or family, could be a team, you know, like uh, when you have um, 
in uh, when you apply game theory to uh, let's say uh, uh, soccer football yeah, then the uh, uh, soccer is a two person game it's not a, a 22 person game yes it's a two person game uh, it could be a country. Very, very often in applications of game theory, we talk about, uh, um, oh, uh, it could be uh, Israel and uh, the uh, Israel and, and Arab countries, or Israel and the United States, or uh, what have you. Yes, uh, the the. Uh, uh, many times uh, a country is considered a, in applications, a country is the player. So, uh, or it could be a persuasion. It could be like a, politi a political persuasion. It could be, for example, in many applications of game theory, we have uh, the players are the political parties. Uh, and and uh, the Knesset is considered not a game with 120 players, <coughs> but it's considered a game with uh, the, each the, each party, like the Likud and Kadima and uh, uh, um, uh, Yisrael Beitenu, and each of these is a player in the game, and we analyze the game using game theory with that number of players. Um, it could be a community, uh, it could be a corporation. In, in economic games, the players are identified with corporations. It could be a workplace, okay? It could be a hospital, a department in a university. It could be the university itself could be a player in in a in a game. It could be a research center. It's uh, um, it could be even in biology. It could be a species, okay, or a a a, 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 po a population. And we'll talk about that a little more um, a little more. Uh, uh, in detail uh, later on, or va various other kinds of uh, collectives. Yes, a player can, in in applications of game theory, a player is very often not an individual person, but a collective um, of some kind. Uh, so this is. This is the way we think of players in game theory. But we realize that it isn't really that way. Those aren't the real players. When we say Israel is a player in a game, and in, with, in an international game, we say, is it really, it isn't really that way. Usually this is understood as an idealization a kind of small world's principle, a la Savage. You'll remember that um, in, in Savage's Foundations of Statistics, in developing a decision theory, he said that people must decide, for example, whether to buy a car or not to buy a car, yes, and, and what are the consequences of that. But they, they, they don't go through the whole um, a big analysis of what people, what you're going to do with the car, and what are the probabilities that you will be go the here or there, and that this or that will happen to you when you use the car. They you, they see the car, buying the car or not buying the car, uh, the price that it has. They give this in itself a utility, and uh, uh, they do not ascribe, uh, they don't go further into the analysis, they don't figure out what's going to happen in the future altogether. And this, he, he, Savage called this the small world's principle. So this is a kind of small world's principle, to think of a country, for example, as a, uh, as a player. Uh, so in games where, say, countries are modeled as players, the real players, it is usually understood, 
are the individual citizens with their individual goals and individual decisions and individual free will. Okay, it's only because this true game with millions of players throughout the world is uh, too big and unwieldy to analyze. Yes, it's much easier to write down a, 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 a stag hunt uh, uh, or, or a, a prisoner's dilemma or something like that and put that on the screen and, and analyze that and saying, here's Israel, here's the Arabs, um, then, uh, then to go through this tremendous game and we wouldn't be able to handle that, we wouldn't be able to uh, say anything useful at all. So we, we take this as an idealization. So it's only because the true game is too big and unwieldy to analyze that it is held. Game theorists model players in the way they do. So today, I'm going to try to sell the idea to you that it is really that way. That, that, uh, Okay, this is a conceptualization, a way of thinking about things. Uh, but even tables are not very easy to analyze, or chairs, yes? These are complex objects, as we just heard, yes? So uh, I'm going to try to... Uh, we heard uh, in the previous lecture that a table is really the way we think of the table, and it's not the table itself, yes. So the table itself is a very mysterious object. So I'm saying a player is a mysterious object, and it's the way we think of the player that's important. I'm suggesting that we think of the player as uh, actually um, the players in, let's say, in an international game are the countries themselves, for example. Yes, so we're going to try to sell the idea that collectives are like individual people and uh, may and perhaps should be thought of as such, as, as, as individual people or as individual components. Okay, so let's, let's Try to spell that out a little bit. Uh, add that perhaps not only in game theory. So in game theory, I'm suggesting that collectives are like individual people, and perhaps not only in game theory. Maybe it's useful to think of collectives like we think of individual people in, uh, in other areas of thought as well. So let's look at the, let's compare individual people with collectives. So individual people are composed of cells, right? Uh, that's the basic building block. Uh, of course, the cells decompose into more basic things also, but let's just think of individual people as being composed of cells. Collectives are composed of people. So a collective, like a country, is composed of individual citizens. They are, so to speak, the cells of the, that person. Individual people are grouped in organs and limbs. The cells in, within the person is grouped into various kinds of structures, organs, limbs, uh, what have you. Collectives are grouped also into various uh, structures, into economic, social, political entities. Yeah, and they are distinct stru uh, structures within the uh, within the um, uh, within this collective. So again, thinking of a country, we have uh, we have. Uh, government departments, we have courts, we have, uh, uh, um, we have uh, parliaments, uh, uh, is thinking of uh, uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, structures, we have various corporations, we have labor unions, we have so and so on and so forth. I mean, this is quite obvious that the collectives are grouped in various kinds of various kinds of uh, uh, substructures. And these substructures uh, 
are in individual people are inter interdependent. You have um, uh, uh, you, you, you can think of, of the bloodstream as being part of of uh, uh, is being one kind of structure, and and you can think of organs like the heart or the liver or the the kidneys as being other structures, and the, of course the bloodstream interacts with these other organs and the collectives also the economic, the social, the political entities are interdependent and interact with each other. Individual people change over time. In particular, they age and die. And the same thing is true of collectives. They change over time. In particular, they age and die. The uh, nations, uh, most of the nations that existed um, a thousand years ago don't exist anymore. Some of them do. England existed a thousand years ago. England did not exist two thousand years ago. Uh, some of the nations uh, survive, yes, like the Jewish nation, but this is it's quite unusual. Most nations change over time and they age and die. Um, individual people have diseases. Uh, collectives also have diseases, crime, pollution, yes. um, uh, countries are plagued with all kinds of problems. Uh, inter individual people have internal mechanisms to fight the, uh, uh, the diseases. Yes, white blood cells, uh, Im Im uh, immune mechanisms and so on. Collectives also have internal mechanisms to fight the diseases. Police, courts, public awareness in the case of um, pollution. Uh, so they, they have, uh, just like individual people, collectives also have diseases and ways to fight them, internal ways to fight them. Individual people have relationships with other individual people. They could be friendly or hostile, yes. Fre uh, nations, uh, uh, um, um, individual people can react, interact with other people, and all other people, different people in all kinds of ways, and so collectives also. Alliances, um, friendships, wars, economic cooperation and barriers. So collectives interact with each other in, in very parallel ways that individual people do. Uh, individual people have internal struggles, different ways of looking at things. They are unable to make a decision. They, they within, within the, the, the uh, um, brain itself, or within the decision-making mechanism that an individual person has. He sometimes thinks very hard, should I do this, should I do that? He is uh, pulled in this direction, he's pulled in that direction. Collectives also have internal struggles. In the case of collectives, the internal struggles are represented by different, um, different organizations, yes? Uh, um, I, I mentioned before, uh, um, various uh, uh, political struggles that you could have perhaps uh, on the religious uh, right now it's Hadarat Nashim that's the name of the game uh, and so you have internal struggles within, collect within the, the whole collective uh, as well um, these struggles with individual people are uh, are, they come to some kind of resolution, they're resolved in some way. In the case of collectives, they're also resolved in uh, some way. By the way, let me ask, uh, uh, do, you, do you hear me clearly? Yes? Uh, because I, I've been having trouble with my, uh, w with hearing the, the uh, lectures uh, I think the acoustics in this room are not the best. Um, so if you hear me, it's okay. 
individual people make decisions eventually. They may have internal struggles, but they make decisions, and they make decisions consciously or otherwise. Yesterday we heard uh, uh, Professor Kahneman talking about System 1 and System 2. So System 1 is sort of the automatic uh, um, uh, way of doing things. So it's this almost subconscious. System 2 uh, is, is totally volitional, thought out. Okay, so people, individual people make decisions in one way or another. And collectives also make decisions. Okay, they could make them centrally, Yes, the, the prime minister or the parliament or, or the court, yes, which is uh, whatever it is, who, whoever makes the real decisions in this country, uh, um, uh, they, they, they make a, a definite decision or, or, or things happen in some other way. In set. But decisions are made. The country, the, the collective uh, um, proceeds in some way. So it's if you try to sort of uh, look at collectives and individual people as abstract systems, then it, it would be difficult to say that there is some kind of clear dividing line between them. Okay. Now, the dividing line that you could uh, perhaps suggest is that individual people have their own free will. They have their volition. They can decide what they want freely. Uh, whereas collectives don't have, don't really have some kind of will. And, and I'm going to suggest to you that this it sounds that way, and each of the individ each one of us who are cells in this large uh, um, collective, each one of us feels that way. I have an individual will, and I can do what I want. But I'm going to suggest to you that it isn't really that way. Individual will is heavily influenced by the collective. So the, the, it's not so much. I mean, I I think that I I. Uh, can decide what I want, yeah? I, I'm, of my own free will, I lay twilling in the morning, okay? Uh, but, you know, it isn't really that way, yes? Uh, uh, I lay twilling in the morning of my own free will, but I was brought up in a family where all the people, the, the people lay twilling. I went to a yeshiva. I grew up. I, I grew up in the in the Orthodox community, and the thing to do there is to lay tefillin, and it that is what makes me want to lay tefillin in the morning, as of my own free will. But it is it is directed by the whole collective, by this collective that that I mentioned before, which by the way I I grew up uh, as a Haredi, but. Uh, uh, but uh, switched over to Kippah Soga, but this also it's 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 uh, it's influenced by the collective. So uh, another way, for example, it, is the the, the uh, we see this in the family. It, it's amazing how often um, the children of the family choose the same kind of careers that their parents chose. It's amazing. One sees it again and again. Um, uh, yes, the children of uh, physicians become physicians, the children of lawyers become lawyers, the children of merchants take over the family business, the, uh, uh, the children of mathematicians become mathematicians, very often, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not universal, certainly far from universal, but it, it is amazingly prevalent. They, of course, they chose their uh, profession of their own free will, right? Well, I don't know, yeah, I mean, you could say, right, they did it of their own free will, but their own free will was heavily influenced by the environment that they had. I just uh, spoke with uh, 
uh, Ruth Rabin, uh, where did I see her? I, a couple of days ago, I spoke with Ruth Rabin, the, the wife of Michael Rabin. Michael is in Harvard. Ruth is here um, uh, on a vacation or on, on a trip. And they have two children. One child is a mathematician, a computer scientist, in fact, a prominent computer scientist, just like the father. The other child is a lawyer, just like the mother, okay? So it's, it's, it, this is uh, uh, very prevalent. And, and one could say the child uh, chooses his own career, but, and it does, but it's also a product of the collective. Um, by and large, people don't change persuasions, okay? Uh, by and large, okay, you have chosrim b'tshuva, you have chosrim b'sheila, but by and large, people don't, uh, don't uh, uh, change their persuasions. They grow, grow up in a certain atmosphere, and they continue in this way, okay? Uh, as a rule, okay? Not in each individual case. By and large, people identify with the collectives to which they belong. And the collectives to which they belong identify with them, yes. We identify with the Center for the Study of Rationality, yes. This is our, our, uh, our hero. We, we try to, uh, we, we try to um, do what we can to advance the uh, Center for the Study of Rationality. Here we spent uh, 10 years fighting with Menachem Magidor about this. <laughs> I smile, Menachem. <laughs> okay. You don't have to fight with us anymore. <laughs> you gave it over to another Menachem. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, so people identify with the collectives, yes. Uh, uh, there's a work ethic, okay. Uh, the, the each, each individual, uh, for example, hospital, okay. There's a hospital in Jerusalem called Shari Tzedek. There's a hospital. Uh, there are, there's a hospital in Jerusalem called Hadassah. There are other hospitals. There's Hadassah in Karen. There's Hadassah at Sofim. Each one has its own uh, uh, work ethic. Each one is very has a different atmosphere. It's very different from from the other one. And these these. Uh, these identities, and they're real identities, they're shaped by, by communication and uh, by uh, incentives. Because within each one of these collectives, uh, the, the, the incentive is to identify with the, with your, uh, with, with the whole collective, and the, the uh, the way in which you operate is, um, you see this, you, people communicate with each other, uh, the, and, and this is um, communicated to the whole, uh, to all the individual cells in the collective. Uh, when did I start? I forgot to look at the clock. I started at 11.25. Huh? Okay. Uh, so what time do you have now? 8 to 12. Okay. Um, so and how much time do I have? An hour or three quarters of an hour? An hour, okay. So uh, let me uh, quote this uh, verse. Um, from Leviticus, I'll, I'll uh, uh, read this out in Hebrew. Vayikovet Hashem vayikalel. So there was this uh, this uh, uh, person who, who, who uh, in the in the when the Israelites were in the desert, the children of Israel were in the desert. They uh, there was this one person who was caught uh, for one reason or another. Um, uh, 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 cursing the the name, the the name of uh, God, 
And then it says, V'shem imo Shlomit bat devri lamatei dan, his mother's name was such and such, and her father's name was such and such, and the tribe was the tribe of Dan. So Rashi says over there, right there on the place, he says, Magid sharasha gorem gnai lo, gnai laviv, gnai le shifto. Rashi says, is a, the wicked person, the one who cursed, uh, causes uh, disgrace, brings disgrace on himself, disgrace on his father, disgrace on his um, on his tribe. Okay, so he, he brings first of all disgrace on himself, and then it mentions two other collectives. Yes, the uh, the the, uh, the the father as being a, a symbol for the collective of his family and a disgrace on his tribe. Uh, why would, and he mentions another case, is one of the architects of the, of the tabernacle. Shevach lo, shevach laviv, shevach l'shivto. Um, yeah, I misspelled Shevet over here, I'm sorry. Uh, so, the, the, what, what is, uh, what, what, what's going on over here? If, if people were only individual people, yes, then why would somebody doing something wicked bring uh, disgrace on him and doing something good, why would it bring praise on him? Yes. When people get prizes in the Center for Rationality, the whole center is happy. Why? Why is the whole center happy? Why is the whole university happy when somebody gets a prize? Yes. Why is that? Yes. If, if people are only individual people, if they're not uh, if the collective doesn't matter, if everybody has his own will, why does it matter if somebody gets a prize? Why, why, or, 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 or somebody, uh, um, uh, uh, somebody does something wicked? On the other hand, it brings disgrace. Why does it bring disgrace? The, it brings disgrace because the individual person is not an individual person. He is shaped by the collective. He, the collective is. Uh, the, the collective shapes him, and therefore when he does something wicked, it is in a, in a large sense the fault, the disgrace of the collective. And when he does something good, it is the, the um, uh, it is to be attributed to the whole collective as well. There is a, a, um, a saying, uh, in the Talmud, Kol Yisrael Arevim uh, All of Israel, each, each, each Jew is responsible for each other Jew. So usually this is taken to mean that if you see a Jew in trouble, then you have to go and help him. But I think maybe it has a different meaning as well. Maybe the meaning is that the um, That really the 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 whole nation is is made up of these individual people who who uh, who compose the nation and and the, and each one affects the other one. It just as a physical statement, not only that one has to help, one should morally help the other one. But each one is affected by all the others and is influenced by all the others and influences them. So we have uh, th th this we, we have this idea of personification, yeah, of thinking of uh, thinking of the collective as an individual, and we have this in in science in in several places. Yes, I'm going to mention. Uh, three. One has nothing to do with game theory, is social insects. In so, the, um, the, and the other two are items from game theory, and that is the, 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 the relationship between populations 
and individuals uh, is, is the uh, sorry the 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 um, the fact that you can see populations as playing the evolutionary game it is the, this is the 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 foundation of the connection between evolution and uh, game theory. This was uh, uh, a con contribution of Maynard Smith and Price in 1972, and it has evolved tremendously since then. And it's the reason that we have evolutionary biologists in the center for the uh, um, uh, in the cent in the rationality center. Okay, we have. Uh, uh, the, uh, our three senior evolutionary biologists, uh, um, uh, Schmida and uh, Cohen and Moto, uh, and we have a lot of young students who are following this, and this is a, a major part of the of game theory. I think it's one of the most important parts of game theory. And over there, the players are the populations, and I'll. I'll if I have time, I'll, I'll lay that out a little more thoroughly. And we have another aspect in coalitional game theory where um, a, in, in many uh, contexts, the, a, a collective acts just like an individual will act. This is a theorem of Sergio Hart. Uh, I think it was part of his thesis, right, Sergio? Yeah. Part of his doctoral thesis. Oh, it's a long time ago, 1974. That's uh, a few years ago. Um, let me lay some of this out right away in social insects. With social insects, like bees, ants, termites, and wasps, there's a school of thought in entomology that thinks of the nest the, or the hive, in the case of bees, as the individual. The individual over there, haprat, yes, is not the individual worker or soldier or queen or drone or what it is, but it is the whole nest is thought of as, it's, this is especially attractive in the case of social insects because actually the, the, uh, uh, the, the nest consists of these different, biologically different kinds of entities. Yeah, the worker is biologically different, he has a different uh, um, uh, genetic structure, and also uh, 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 the, 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 the way he looks is different from the way he, he uh, 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 from the way a, a uh, uh, a different ant looks. I mean, workers don't look like soldiers. A soldier doesn't look like queen. The, they are much larger. So in, in human beings, we have two types of human beings. We have males and females. But in, the, in social insects, there are four or five different types. So you can think of them as organs in the hive, and the individual is the hive or the nest. Um, let me lay out a little bit. The, the matter of population equilibrium is the same as a Nash equilibrium. So let me remind you, a Nash equilibrium of a game is a profile of possibly, in other words, a list of possibly, of, of a list of strategies. They could be mixed, one for each player. And each of these strategies is best possible for that player given the others strategies. An equilibrium of populations. Okay, so now let's, let's, uh, um, let's think uh, in, 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 in evolutionary terms. We have a population like a species, or it could be a larger population or a smaller population, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's a group of them, of many, many, uh, individuals and uh, and we're thinking of them over time not necessarily just these individuals today but tomorrow and the day after and what it is is population equilibrium it's a profile of genotypes okay 
or it could be distributions of genotypes, one for each population, okay, just like we have one Geno like, just like we have one strategy for each player in the equilibrium of a game, we have one genotype or one distribution of genotypes. It could be a mixture, just like with mixed strategies, under which the population proportions do not change from generation to generation. They stay constant. This is a population equilibrium, okay? Now, let's think of a game whose players are the populations. The strategies are the possible genotypes. And the payoffs to a profile of genotypes, to a list of genotypes, to a profile, one for each population, is the change in fitness of each individual when individuals with those genotypes meet. This is the basic model which connects evolutionary biology uh, with uh, uh, game theory. Uh, by fitness, what we mean by fitness is the expected number of offspring, okay? So when you eat, when an animal eats, when it's hungry and it eats, it is able to replenish its energy, it's able to live longer, it has an increase in fitness. When a bee comes to a flower and sucks uh, um, uh, nectar from the flower, it increases its fitness. And the fitness of the flower also increases because the flower is pollinated. So we're playing a game over here. The game is not a choice of strategies, what strategy benefits me more, but it is a it is automatically what happens when you have interactions of this kind. And then the population equilibria in the ecological story coincide with the Nash equilibria of the corresponding uh, game. Okay? So we, we have over here in game theory, we have, uh, and in evolutionary biology, so in this application of game theory, we have a population, a collective, acting as an individual. So this is, uh, uh, this is an example where personification actually occurs in, in uh, science. Um, okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about Hart's theorem. Um, so I'd like to, I have to give you a little background over here. Von Neumann Morgenstern's stable set of a coalitional game, like think of a market, yes, uh, a market with several sides, like em employers or employees, yes, so it's, we, what we mean by when we say von Neumann Morgenstern stable set, it's a collection of outcomes with certain stability properties. Okay, for example, in large markets with differentiated players like employers and employees, so we have a market, a large market, we have some employers, some employees. The von Neumann Morgenstern stable set of the large market mimics the von Neumann Morgenstern stable set of the small market, that with only one representative of each type. So let me spell this out. For example, when there are only one employer and one employee, the von Neumann Morgenstern stable set provides that they can divide the surplus in any way they want. What do I mean by the surplus? When there's, only, when there's only one employer and one employee in the world, okay, and the employer wants the employee to work for him, and this will create some benefit for both. Yes, they will be able to make money for bo both. So how, how, do they, how do they divide this benefit? Yes, so. The employer could take a large part and pay the employee a small wage, or the employee could 
get a large wage, could demand a large wage and get one. There are all kinds of possibilities. Now, when you take the same kind of business, the same kind of manufacture, and you take many employers of this kind and many employees, then the surplus can again be divided arbitrarily, but all employers must pay the same wage to their employee. You cannot have a situation where some employers pay a, high, a higher wage and some employers pay a lower wage the same. This would be an unstable situation. And this is just one example of a very general theorem that was proved by us. So what are we saying over here? What does this sort of imply? It implies, as von Neumann and Morgenstern themselves pointed out, it implies a kind of social organization in which the employees uh, appear as a collective. They appear as a group, a union, for example. And the employers appear as um, a manufacturers association. And the, the, there is collective bargaining. That is the name actually used. The, bar, the, the, um, the manufacturers association uh, bargains with the, employ, with the union. And they all get the same price. Just like in Israel, we have a situation like that where all the universities pay the same salaries to their professors uh, for a given rank. All, they all, there's a sort of collective bargaining in this situation, but it's not the universities that bargain, it's the, uh, it's the treasury. But uh, we have this kind of situation where all get the same salaries across the board. It's a situation which I don't particularly recommend, but I'm just saying the, the, all, the, pre, all the, uh, the professors, all the academics in the country sort of appear like a collective and all the universities appear like a collective. Um, okay, so... Uh, Let's go on. I'll give you uh, another example of personification. We had three examples of personification in science. I'll give some examples of personification in the Torah. Uh, so we have Vayusu b'nei Yisrael et enehem v'enei Mitzrayim noseya achareihem v'yerum od. So this is before the crossing of the Red Sea. The uh, Israelites, the children of Israel, saw Egypt uh, traveling after them. Now, this is, doesn't come through so, uh, uh, so vividly in English as it does in Hebrew, but maybe some of the people in this room do understand Hebrew. So, uh, um, the, over here we have Egypt appearing in the singular and the verb traveling, pursuing, is in the singular. Nosea, Mitzrayim Nosea, lo Mitzrim Nosim, but Mitzrayim Nosea, Egypt is uh, in the singular pursuing them. And, and they, they were much afraid, the children of Israel were much afraid. So what does Rashi say on that point, on that uh, verse? He says, Belev echad ke ish echad, which means Egypt was traveling after, was, uh, uh, was pursuing them of one mind like one person. So Egypt was being considered as one person. That's why it says this in the singular. Egypt was an individual was like the collective is becomes the individual. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, after the Egyptians were destroyed in the Red Sea, the children of Israel come to uh, Mount Sinai and says, Vayavo midbar Sinai, Vayichan sham Yisrael neged hahar. They came to, the, uh, to Mount Sinai and Israel camped 
again in the singular, not the children of Israel camp, but Israel as one item, one individual camp, and it's written in the singular, Vayichan Sham Yisrael, not Vayachnu Sham Bnei Yisrael. Okay? And again Rashi says, Keish Echad Belev Echad, which is like one person of one mind. Uh, Rashi reverses the order over here. It's an interesting question why he reverses the order. I mean, it's very, it's very, uh, I mean, it, it, the question is beg, one, the question begs itself, it raises itself. Why does he reverse the order? In one case he says of one mind like one person, in the other case he says like one person of one mind. Um, I, I don't want to discuss this at the moment. Frankly, I don't know the answer. <laughs> uh, possible implications of this view. So there are, I think, two major implications. One is we have like I was saying at the beginning, we have a full world analysis of game situations. In other words, we're not, this is not, if we go back to the first slide, uh, it, we're not going to adopt the view that a play, that thinking of a player as a collective that this is not really that way, we go, we are going to adopt the view that it is really that way, okay? That is one implication. But I also said that there may be implications of this outside of game theory. And that is that this sort of implies that one can make moral judgment of collectives, yes? You can say not only that the individual person in a, uh, is, is bad, is good, is wicked, is, is uh, uh, well, but also the whole collective can be considered bad or good. You have relations between collectives. You can have friendly relations between collectives as such. Think of them as a collective, as a nation. Uh, you can have unfriendly relation, you can have enmities, you can have uh, fights, you can have love, whatever it is, yes. But you can, th this thinking of the collective as an individual is, affects a different way of how you should uh, think of other collectives and also how, how a collective can, for example, be bad, can be considered bad, wicked, or an enemy, without, e without each individual in the collective being an enemy. The individ each individual does not have to be, uh, uh, some of the individuals, certainly, I mean, if all the individuals in the collective are your friends, it would be difficult to imagine that the collective would be your enemy. That is unlikely. But it certainly can happen that some of the individuals in the collective uh, can be uh, considered friendly, but the whole collective could still be considered um, uh, an enemy or, or, or uh, antagonistic to you, or evil. The whole collective could be, in fact, evil without certain individuals in it being evil. Okay? Now, uh, this viewpoint is a way of looking at things, and, and it, I think it's an illuminating way of looking at things. I'm not necessarily advancing it as the right way. Uh, uh, I think a dual approach is probably most sensible. There are collectives which should be thought of as having an identity of their own, of course composed of individuals, but a separate identity of their own. At the same time, there are also individuals in those collectives who also have uh, their identity. And I'd like to give one example of that, and that is uh, the Center for the Study of Rationality at the Hebrew University. 
So it's a collective, which means that it's composed of different people with different ideas, different uh, uh, ways of thinking. Uh, each individual one uh, is has a different approach and and must be uh, uh, thought of as as having a, a different approach and its own identity. But it also has a it also has a collective identity, yes. So one can think of it also as an individual. Toda Abba. Thank you. Many thanks to Israel for this uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture. I must say, it, this lecture gave me a strong urge uh, to do something wicked. Uh, and now we have time for uh, one or two questions. Okay, right. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, um, the example from Rashi was brought as a case where there is personification in the Torah. Yeah, I'm going beyond Rashi. Okay. I didn't catch the question. I think ya Yaakov referred to the similarity of this idea with, what do you say, racism or fascism or? Racism. racism. What? Racist. 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 Uh, um. uh, you, you're saying you're... Racism is a collective and uh, some people know other people different qualities to a race by behaviors of individuals in the race. Well, I mean, I think ra ra racism, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, um, you remember what uh, John Hancock said, I think, or well, it wasn't John Hancock, one of the fathers of the American Revolution made a fiery speech in the uh, latter part of the uh, 18th century in which he uh, lashed out at the king of uh, England and said, and then he ended his speech is, if this be treason, make the most of it, okay? So I say to you, if this be racism, make the most of it, okay? Uh, uh, call it whatever you want, yes? Uh, let's talk about it on its merits. That's what I'm suggesting. But, uh, racism refers to some kind of biological entity, yes? For example, a, a black and a white, yes, this would be racism to set apart, uh, um, a, 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 to say that uh, blacks are, but blacks don't form a collective and whites don't form really a collective, yes? So in other words, we, uh, we uh, I, th I think a, a, a society which integrates uh, uh, blacks and whites in the same society like our society does uh, is, is uh, um, uh, yes, uh, to say that, for example, Israel is different, uh, yes, from certain other countries, yeah, maybe Arab countries, maybe Switzerland, maybe this, maybe that. Israel is advanced in technology, Israel has high moral standards, Israel is this, Israel is that. Yeah, this is not racism. I don't consider it racism. If you want to call it racism, be my guest. Maybe one last question or remark? Yes. yes. Hello. Uh, there came into my possession the, the text of the last lecture that the 
that the 19th century, early 20th century philosopher Josiah Royce There came into my possession the text of the last lecture that the great 19th century, early 20th century American idealist philosopher Josiah Royce gave in his class on metaphysics at Harvard. And he agreed with you. He, he, he was very much against what he called methodological individualism, which is a term used for the idea that but the idea that you oppose, the idea that the real reality is only the individuals. And he said to his class, the reason I don't believe that individuals are fundamental and not collectives is that I myself am a collective. The professor who teaches this course is not the same professor as the professor who teaches such and such a course, which in fact everyone knew was also taught by him. And that's not the same person as the professor who, who teaches such and such a course. Another course was also taught by him. I am a collective. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is a good time to end with two great collectives and uh, thank you very much.